Yeah, welcome to the, the truth about the future of work. Um, so there's so many, really, yesterday when you were, if you were at the conference, we, we talked a lot about the future of work already, the role of AI, automation, fears, possibilities. It's been an ongoing conversation, really, in, uh, in our societies. And uh, I think what we're trying to do with this session is to probe some of the assumptions, test some of the narratives, see if they hold true, if there are other insights, other perspectives that we may have neglected, uh, and hear from, from two uh, experts who come from, from very different backgrounds. First, we have Judith Wallenstein. Uh, she's a senior partner, uh, managing director at the Boston Consulting Group, uh, leads the healthcare practice in Germany. She's also director of the BCG Henderson Institute for Europe. And Judith uh, has done a lot of work on the future of work and has conducted research recently about the perception and the fears and expectations of uh, the worker, the factory worker, shop worker, workers who are below the average national income and what the future of work actually might mean for them and how they feel about it. And I think that's really interesting because yesterday, remember, we added this breakout session on inclusion and diversity <coughs> that we did in response to this feeling like, well, are we having an elitist conversation? Are we kind of stuck in our own bubble of the knowledge economy middle, upper management, creative economy, right? Are we missing the point here? Like, and this is an opportunity really to hear based on the data that Judith will present about a, a different segment of the population and that might actually yeah, change some of our assumptions uh, indeed. And then after Judith, uh, we'll hear from Alice Haw. Alice Haw is a futurist and architect, um, studied at Bartlett in, in London at the Royal Academy of Arts in, in Copenhagen. Uh, she works for UN Studio which is one of the, the most uh, prestigious, innovative architecture firms, urban planning firms in the world. Uh, she's done a lot of amazing research on, for example, post-Brexit passports is a concept that you developed that uh, seems quite desirable for some people probably. Yeah. Um, and you are, you've been working and, and, about and, and thinking about the future of work from the angle of urban planning. I think you studied WeWork and, and how to involve various stakeholders and, and how urban design can help shape the future of work. We'll hear from, from Alice uh, in the second part of the session. We'll definitely have time for questions, and definitely have time also for dialogue between the two of them. But without any further ado, uh, let me welcome Judith Wallenstein and uh, her insights on the future of work. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> so, you know, you said it already, Tim. Where did we start this work at the Henderson Institute? And we started it precisely because of actually two conversations we had. One was, we were asked, so how do you forecast the future of work, right? What's, what are your figures on where jobs will go and which skills we need? And, and finally, we felt that was the wrong answer because in a way, the future is fundamentally unforecastable. And the second was the discussion I had with, with a client, um, the head of strategy of, of a major European bank and he said, Judith, you just have absolutely no clue, right? You don't understand that I sit on tens of thousands of call center workers and bank tillers, and those are people who are unwilling and unable to change. And now give me a better answer. And so with, with uh, Martin Reeves, who, who you heard um, earlier today, and, and Elise, my colleague, we said, look, I mean, we need to bring some data to that debate because every one of us has their own, own point of view. And, and if you look at this picture for me, and, and you think about all of us, probably more represented by this suit, if we like it or not, and if we look at, at the man on, uh, at the picture, and, and you look at the broader workforce, you probably have to admit that you could look at it anecdotally, like I look at it when I talk to my car mechanic, right? His job has changed fundamentally from what it was 20 years ago, and when he comes with my, his computer, plugging into my car, understanding what is wrong, that has nothing to do with what my car mechanic on my first car did when, when I was 18. And in a way, you could argue that he's just one of these examples where his job has changed a lot more already in the past 20 years than the job of most managers. And obviously, he has adapted. But well, that's one example. That doesn't tell us that that's the, the truth. So we went out and we basically said we need to find some data around it. And if it doesn't exist, we need to generate it. And we really started from that common wisdom and we wanted to understand, is it true, right? Is the general narrative you, you hear so often 
And Jacob just said in, in the former session, we probably heard a bit too, too much of, of the doom and gloom on technology. So yesterday, so, so today was potentially a bit more, more of an optimistic discussion. What does it really mean? Because such a lot of the discussion on the dominant forces that drive the future of work is on technology and technology alone. Very much with the undercurrent that this will be negative and specifically it will be negative to everyone but the very high skilled end of the workforce. And that is where we realized we just didn't have good enough data to prove that. And um, then the, the other part of the common wisdom is what I just mentioned, this, this pervasive narrative that for the average Joe, as we call him, this is the part of the workforce, millions and millions of people who will be unwilling or unable or both to adapt, to, to envision themselves in new jobs, to, to acquire new skills, to go on completely different learning paths. And then finally, if this was really the dire situation that I'm describing, even more that calls for the enlightened manager who top-down knows what the future brings, who can take his herd of sheep along and who can take them to this different future knowing how difficult it will for him to deal with this workforce that, that's unwilling and unable to adapt. So uh, that was the, the common wisdom. We, we wanted to tear apart and see what the data tells us. So we went out and we generated that data. And very quickly, how did we do it? Probably to start on the right-hand side, which is a lot more interested. We went out this April and we talked to 11,000 workers globally, from Brazil and China and India to all of our mature markets. We took 11,000 workers and we designed our sample to make sure that those were not the prestigious universities, those were not the great four-year college degrees from fantastic schools, but that we had a sample who for each and every country was below the respective national averages for household income and for educational attainment. And we really made sure that that skewed towards that part of the population. With one big caveat that I should mention, we included people who are unemployed but we excluded people who were unemployed for more than a year. So, so that was the data sample we constructed, and that has its limitations, but these were the people we wanted to give a voice to. And in order to contrast that, um, we took uh, roughly 6,500, 7,000 managers, and we went out with the Harvard um, Business School, and we asked those people precisely the same types of questions, really to mirror what broad parts of the workforce around the globe think, and what their managers really on CEO and executive levels think. And what I'd like to do with you today would really be share some of, of those insights we had and then have a discussion with you and, and Elise and Tim on why that's the case and, and what the patterns are that, that uh, you see. So first, we went out to talk with them about 17 forces that shape the future of work. And you just see the big buckets that um, we group them in. But just to make that point, yes, of course, we ask about technology. We asked how much they believe that their jobs will either be augmented or replaced by different technologies. And we had a number of questions we asked there. We talked with them about the demise of unskilled labor. To what extent do they believe that skilled requirements will, will constantly be on the rise? We talked about shifting workforce pools. Um, the, where will talent scarcity occur? Where will minorities that are not as much part of the workforce today in many markets, immigrants, women, the elderly, how much will we need them to be the future workforce? And we talked with them about changing employee expectations, the demand for people expecting more purpose in their work, more direct impact of what they're doing, more autonomy in their teams. Um, new working models challenging the boundaries of the corporation. Who's my employee anymore if part of people are gig workers and project workers and freelancers and people who might want to work for different companies at the same time? And then finally, we also talked to them about the, and with them about the evolution in the business um, and policy environment. Um, what will policymakers do? Are there new systems for taxation um, that they expect? So you actually see it was a pretty broad set of trends and it was really to widen people's views not to not only talk about technology. And for me, one of the interesting, most interesting findings when talking to our 11,000 workers was they see these trends coming they have a very differentiated picture on what will impact their own personal work lives. And interestingly, they were much better able to differentiate these trends than the managers who, in front of whom we put precisely the same trends. So if you want to put it, you know, simply looking at it from a mathematical perspective, our workers had, I think, 14% points between the highest ranked trends and the lowest ranked trends when we asked them 
which ones of those will be relevant for your own work biographies, while our managers think with eight or nine percent points different, but more or less tried, said every trend is roughly important, roughly the same, roughly hitting us at the same time. And workers told us this future of work is already there. And the two trends they ranked highest, which you probably might expect or not, was not technology. The first one was that they said, our customers' expectations are changing so quickly that we as a company have to change our business model all the time. And in my team, I have to think how I adapt to that. So that for them, that speed of change <coughs> and the fact that they as a team have to find answers what what they thought was already there and very much part of their daily work. And the second one was that they said, we will need more flexibility, more autonomy in how we work. Um, we need to see more impact from we're do what we're doing and we need to know why we do this. And these two ranked highest long before a number of the technology trends. But let me take you to, to some more <coughs> facts on how they answered. So the first, was, f first one was, before we ask our workers to rank these 17 trends, we asked them, how happy are you with your employment situation? Has it improved in the past five years? And do you, how do you expect it to develop in the next five years? And we learned that overall, workers were reasonably happy with their employment situation. In most parts of the planet, they felt it had improved over the past five years. And then, obviously, you know, we got challenges from colleagues and friends who said those workers are all totally self-delusioned, right? They don't realize the train that's coming. They don't realize that their situation has actually deteriorated already. And so we went in for those segments that we had surveyed, and we really looked how their average incomes and how the average unemployment rates in their specific nations had developed. And actually, we realized those people were very realistic. They were where their situation was improving, this was reflected in their sentiment. Where the situation had been more difficult, you saw it in the national data. But overall, what they told us is they were, as soon as they talked about their very personal work biographies, they were reasonably happy with it. When they, when they evaluated those forces I told you about that shaped the future of work, they were acutely aware of them. As mentioned, they were much better able to differentiate them than the managers. Um, and they also thought that most of them will hold more opportunities for them than threats. So for each and every turn, we ask them, when is this coming for you? When will it have an impact? Is that more an opportunity? Is it more a threat? And the picture was overwhelmingly more positive than negative, with very few examples that I, I can happily, uh, exceptions that I can happily take in, in the questions. And then we asked them, okay, so if this is what's coming, can you prepare? And the majority of workers said, yes, we can. And ask who was responsible for it the majority of them said, it's me. They didn't say it's the government, they didn't say it's my employer, they said it's me. Globally, over 40% said primarily it's me versus 19% who said it's the government and 19% who said it's my employer. There were two exceptions to that global picture, which you will not be surprised about. Uh, the French workers we interviewed said, well, actually, it's the government. And the <laughs> Japanese workers we interviewed said, well, actually, it should be my employer first. But even in those countries, <laughs> the second one was always, it's me, right? And then where things got really difficult is, how are you getting prepared? And we realized that this is where workers and employees, they look out to their managers for help, because the, the question, we, we gave them a whole set of, of questions to understand how they could, could, could get prepared and where they don't, what the obstacles are. And people come up with very diffuse answers. They come up with saying, I really don't know where I can find a good offering for that skill I have to learn. I don't know if my employer would look favorably to me making this effort. Um, a lot of women had real, real concerns that that was taking away time from their families. Many workers in those lower income brackets were concerned that they were making an investment and from a financial perspective they didn't know it, if it was affordable enough and, and if the, the, in a way the, the benefit they were getting out of it was the right one. And then they were very worried about time to say, where do I take the time from? Will that impact my work? So you actually see your worker's goodwill as a manager is yours to lose. Those people, in our view, consistently across the globe are a lot more positive, forward-looking. 
they have a strong sense of urgent, uh, agency, they know they have to be agents of this change. But they look towards their managers to do their part with, you know, making, you know, guiding, not only guiding them in the sense, I tell you that top down, this is what you have to do, but have a real good dialogue on what do you have to learn on your team? What's urgent? How do we best do it? Who needs to do this? And that is actually the dialogue we feel is not sufficiently taking place. And that's also what we've heard in, in many of our interviews with, with company leaders. So uh, I mentioned that very quickly, but we actually found that, brutally speaking, our managers were a lot more self-delusioned than our workers, right? I mean, what I found the most shocking number, we, took those, we put those same trends in front of them that I shared with you. I mean, tricky pieces like how will you prepare for technology substitution? And seriously, 80 to 90% of our managers feel their organization is either somewhat or well prepared. I mean, not even 15% told us my organization is insufficiently prepared. So then you think, well, actually, you've had a very optimistic day. Or you really don't see what's coming, right? In the same sense, the, the sense of urgency is with managers, and that differentiated a bit by trend, but globally you can see, for them it was always a bit further out, right? There was always a bit less sense of urgency. And those forces, when they had to rank them, they were much less capable to come up with a clean ranking than the workers were. So if you're the average employee in a company, that picture tells you you're in trouble. And you're not in trouble because you don't understand that you have to change, but you're in trouble because you tend to deal with a manager who might not see this, see this coming acutely enough and who might not have a developed enough picture of how now you tackle this problem together. Right? And I'd just like to, to give you one drill down we did because we really wanted to find out for each of those trends how workers think about them and how they act upon them. And we took out our, our technology trends, Elise and I, and, and we looked into those and we, we really wanted to find out how some of those populations that always get talked about but never get talked to, how, how they think. And we took out gig workers, so people who offer their work on gig platforms, labor sharing platforms, whatever you'd like to call them. And let's be clear, given that that sample we had constructed skewed downwards, those are not the highly educated $300,000 a year software developers in some software funkily that no one knows and they have ultra high demand. These are not the ex-consultants who run their freelance businesses. These are not the executive coaches, right? So actually the, the, the prejudice we went into this was well, these are probably delivery drivers and Uber drivers, and they will be destitute and desperate, and they will hate it, and they will want to get out of this as fast as they can. Right? And we actually saw that when we pick out this trend and we, we talk about workers and technology with that focus on gig platforms, the same type of pattern emerged that I shared with you globally. These people are a lot more forward-looking, positive, and have an own sense of urgency than you think, and probably just two, three snippets of data on this. So what the dark green shows you is how much people derive a pro how many people derive a primary income from labor sharing platforms. That number has been pretty stable over the years. So this is what we saw in our sample. It's very much mirrored by macroeconomic data in most countries. You see that in mature markets between 1 and 3 4% of the population declare that they derive a primary income from gig platforms. You already see if you take China and India to the right of this this chart that the number is a lot higher. And if then you ask people, are you using these platforms? And just to make the point, there was no error of margin. We gave them the top 20 Chinese, the top 20 Indian platforms to really see, have you, ha have you worked on these? You actually see that a very high number uses these platforms to derive a secondary source of income. And people also told us a bit about how they were doing it. People who had children and wanted to work late at night um, in the off hours, earning some additional money, People who had disabilities and felt that they were not so easy, you know, it was more difficult to, to have that typical work biography. And many people who just thought it was a skill that they could monetize and, and, and earn some, some additional money with it. So this is the, these are the numbers we, we talk about. Also to remind you that we did a lot of work in the Henderson Institute on asset sharing platforms. So, any platforms where you share asset in the classical sharing economy way. We saw the same picture. We always see that China and India adopt much more quickly than, than other markets. Look at the light green and look at the darker colors on top. What we would like to express with this, even for that sample that we designed of those workers we spoke to, this is not all delivery and Uber drivers. But everything that's above the, the, light, the light green, we really dug into it and see where do, do we see rather 
low salary or low compensation versus higher compensation jobs. And so you see that a fair part of those are in higher skill freelancing, such as IT design, um, personal services. And when we ask people, um, they also told us that about the hours they worked and how satisfied they, they were with their, their salaries. So the picture that emerged was that they said, if you give me a magic wand, and we asked them about the magic wand, and we asked them, would you like to go back to a full-time salary job? Like the 100% contracted in one company, the majority of people said no. I know I work longer hours. I know that on average, um, you know, I might still struggle to, to make end meet, ends meet. Even those people who said probably by the hour I get paid a bit less than I did in a full-time salary job, they said no. I would actually like to stay in my gig situation. I would like more clients on my platform. I would like to improve my cash flow further. So I'm looking at these opportunities, but that was much more their answer than saying, I would like to go back to the classical 100% full-time salaried situation. And when we asked them why, a lot of what came out was to say, it's around my own sense of having a real impact, of um, being adaptable to my way of life. I'm autonomous in choosing why I would like to work. Um, it gives me more, more working opportunities that can be remote um, because I live in a very rural part of the country and I couldn't move for my job. So there were many reasons. That's not to say that there are not many problems with gig work. That's not to say that it's reasonable that a lot of countries think about social security of, of that part of the workforce and how you regulate it, but it's just saying even there, we saw that people who actually do this work and who answer to us on how they do it, they also see the opportunity behind it. So when they deeply reflect about their situation, the picture that we saw in general, that workers have that strong sense of urgency, it holds true for these subpopulations. And then finally, the question is, well, so what do you do about the situation as a company where you have workers who are very willing to do their part, and frankly, you still have a managerial cadre that might need a lot more granular thinking on, on how they do it. And what we learned was what ties very much back to the work that Jake, for example, is doing. First, you really have to get on top of your data as a company. Most companies, and they tell us, have no idea of the skills map of their organization. They just don't know. They have your CV. They have your career progression. But they don't know about your skills. They don't know about the skills of people they could hire. So how do you get that data into the organization? How do you really think about managing your workforce from an ecosystem's perspective of where can you find the talent? Um, and then, then finally, does it have to be your full-time salaried employee? Do you have to share these people with other companies because it might be easier to upscale them at an assignment with one of your suppliers for three months than pushing them into a classroom training? How do you find very adaptable ways to reskill people? Because in that situation I described, the top-down logic is really not always a great logic, and many company leaders told us that their narrative of the top-down reskilling program was a difficult one because how do you find out what needs to, be, needs to be trained? And then who of your tens of thousands of workers need that training? That's a very slow process. It's a very costly one. And many companies now experiment with doing this really bottom-up where people self-select for what they want to learn, where they put their ideas on platforms, where they look for project staffings within the companies more to learn this than a formal training and where managers really strive to, to enable that set of experiments on how you acquire new skills. And that is why we really believe you need to think about a, a real learning organization where you team up with your employees to develop this set of experiments on how to best do it together. And not just say, okay, as the enlightened manager, I can come down with a top-down solution and that will solve my problem. So just some bits and pieces on what we've learned about the people we, that usually don't get really talked about in data. And lots of positive surprises for me, frankly. Lots of question marks on how managers will leverage this to really create a win-win situation with their workforce around that. Brilliant insights from Joseph Wanstein. Thank you very much, Judith. Which am I standing? Just a couple of questions uh, before we uh, bring Alice into the, the conversation. But I think the, the main theme for me here that emerges is agency. Yes. Right? Both in terms yes. of like the, the propensity to the gig economy or the level of satisfaction with the offerings of the gig economy, but also the confidence, right? So both the, the realization of the urgency of changes, but then the willingness to roll up the sleeves and says, yes, you know, we need to prepare for it. Let's get ready for it. It's also a sense as a 
agency, I think, is sort of the, the, the theme I, I would use. And like to, to look at segments of your data, I'd be really interested in both generational differences among the workers that you surveyed. And then also, did you um, spot a difference between rural and urban populations? So um, rural and urban, I cannot tell you. Um, that also has to do with, with the way how we can slice and dice the data and, and what we know about our, our sample. Interestingly, we thought that we would see massive age differences, specifically in those trends that workers rank very highly. So the need for more autonomy, for more purpose and impact in the work, for I want to see the impact of what I'm doing. And you think this is a millennial thing and we will see a big, big spread. Absolutely not. Our 55 to 66 year olds really answer the same way than the 20 year olds. So it seems to be a much more universal ask of our workforce than we think. We did see some national differences, and those are actually rather concerning. Um, across the board, fortunately, we saw very limited gender differences. We specifically saw limited gender differences in emerging markets, but we see them in some of the mature markets. And Germany is one of those examples, and that's actually really concerning, because in a way what you see is uh, women in Germany rank those trends more negatively than men. Um, they saw more threat than opportunity. The, they were one of those countries where you had red bars on the one hand and green bars on the other. They were specifically concerned about their technology trends and they really tried to push them out, right? Like this is happening late and, and I think it's a threat. And if you look at what we just covered, that companies are now really trying too hard to see how can they better skills empower their, their workforce, not only through the one top-down program that comes through in a year, but really helping them self-select what they need to learn, put themselves forward, saying, this is what I need to, to acquire as a skill in my team. If women are more concerned about the situation, if they're more hostile towards the technology trend, chances that they self-select to learn this actually are lower. So you have a real structural disadvantage of a part of your workforce. And we see some of those pockets of differences in, in our data in countries, and I think that is also something where policymakers and em employers have to get together to, to attack these, right? Overall, specifically in, to, in terms of expectations to, towards future jobs, you see great consistency, specifically across age groups. Now, the the counter-narrative, of course, is one that we're all very familiar with, with is, is you know, massive dis disenfranchised workforces. Um, you know, the Gallup survey data, only 30% of employees worldwide are fully engaged. A lot of uh, talk and data about mental health uh, uh, epidemic, loneliness and, and social isolation and stress levels, anxiety levels heightened. So the question is, how do you reconcile that? Or is that sample of data only middle managers, miserable middle managers who do not have the confidence? And, and the clear, you know, sort of the clear side into the future. So how do you reconcile these two competing narratives? Look, I, I mean, I think there is partly a competing narrative, partly it isn't. I mean, I have a lot of trouble with the Gallup survey in the way the questions are asked because, I mean, very often, I mean, there's a small pocket of that population. Usually, A, it's very focused on the U.S., right? And then there's a small po pocket of the population that um, actually is labeled actively disengaged, but usually that is then augmented to those 70%, right? While actually, if you dig into the data, a lot of people are more lukewarm than actively disengaged. To, to your other point, I think there's a big difference if you ask people about their very personal work situation and where they want to take their work lives. And I think that is one of the reasons why people might have been more constructive and positive, that we really ask them about where do you want to take your life and what you see coming. We also have to be very clear, even if we are below our national averages when it comes to income and education, there are, of course, two biases in it. We, people had to have a phone to answer these questions. And second, they were not unemployed for more than a year. So logically, that doesn't give you the picture of the world. We believe it gives you a very important part of the global workforce. But is that the miner in Kentucky who has been unemployed for 10 years? No, right? Um, Although for some of the elements, when you think about John Piero's data last year, right, on, on gig workers, I mean, he had some of similar findings even from rural regions of the US that people have embraced these forms of work. They were actually making rather good salaries per hour. They were taking it into their hands to use that as a, as a part to supplement their salaries. But indeed, um, I, I still think A, when I, I think about Gallup and how actively disengaged the workforce is, I think there's often some misrepresentation of that data. I think there's a bias because we ask really people about what they will be doing with their lives. 
And there's logically, if you Im included a global workforce that has been unemployed from one to 10 years, I'm sure that you would get a different picture. However, that's also not the majority of the workforce. Right? We, we, got a, we have question, uh, time for questions afterwards, but let, let me make sure to bring, uh, thank you, Judith. Thank you. Um, let me make sure to bring Alison to the conversation. Alice, what do you what do you make of this? What do you make of these insights, and how did they relate to the work that you've been you've been doing before we launch your presentation? No, I think it's really interesting, and I'm kind of um, pleased in a way with your quite sensitive balance between data and actually talking to people, because you know we do a lot of work with um, with data at my company. We're a kind of computational architecture company. That's the that's, um, that's been the kind of the foundation of, of how the company designs for a long time. But I'm very interested in the, in the balance, and I think that data is always something which, well, there's sort of two limitations to it, really. It's, it's always historic. It's always based on what's gone before. So it actually paints quite a conservative picture of what's to come in the future. Um, and on the other hand, it's kind of... Uh, quite limited in its scope potentially because you know you're talking to a certain group of people and and I, I really appreciate that you kind of went out and, and asked people also what they felt about things because when da with data it's just about consumption it's you know where did people go what did they buy what did they click on but it's very difficult to know why they did any of those things or what they want um, for the future or what they want from their careers so I, I really appreciate the balance that you were bringing there in between the two. Great. Shall we? <laughs> Do you want me to go on? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's let's uh, shift to your perspective on sure. the future of work and what you've been doing with USM as well and Office Furniture Maker and I think in yeah, other sure, instances. Sure. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, so as I mentioned, oh, this is the last slide. That's the last slide. Is it possible to go? <laughs> you can get a teaser there. <laughs> um, into the future. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It uh, wasn't planned. Um, so I'm a futurist within an architecture company, which is a bit of an unusual role. So I'm exploring the future of the built environment um, through four streams of research, from mobility to living, to work in campus, to culture and commerce, um, and how those different typologies relate. Um, and I wanted to bring a discussion here about the balance or the distinction between spaces of living and spaces of working, um, both in the past and today. And I think this is a perfect environment to do that in because we're sitting in a living room um, of a space that was designed as a domestic building, then converted into a hotel, um, a commercial space. Essentially, they're a very beautiful one. And Tim and his team have brought this discussion around the house of beautiful business. So this, um, this typology is already a kind of fusion in between the domestic realm and the living realm. And of course, it creates quite a different kind of atmosphere to the conversation. It's not a traditional working space, and that sets a tone that is quite inviting and kind of makes us feel differently um, about the conversation we're going to be having. And this actually is quite a historic model. Um, this is a plan of a Roman villa. And you can see there's two um, shops at the front. And actually, there's no solid boundary in between those commercial spaces at the front and the living quarters at the back. So in those times, the, the spaces of production and the spaces of consumption or living are actually very kind of naturally interwoven. And there, there isn't a strong distinction. And this continued right up until the Industrial Revolution. So, so creating um, craft or, or um, produce was actually something that was taking place right within our homes. There wasn't a distinction between domestic work and productive work. Um, and that meant that the role of men and women was also much more balanced, actually. Child work uh, was, was part of everyday work in the home. And it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution when people, mostly men, were kind of cleaved out of the home that we created that distinction and therefore that inequality. Um, and as an architect, I'm always sort of reading uh, these histories and these narratives from a very spatial perspective. So these are some images of Spitalfields, which is the area I grew up in in East London. I know that's a classic TED Talk move, <laughs> but it's also a really interesting place to look at the kind of history of work because it's a very historic environment for that. It's, a, it's an area where the Huguenots fled to 
um, in the 19th century. And you can read, actually, across these streets, um, the, the quarters for work, which was usually at ground floor, uh, and the quarters for living, which was usually above. And I've been in Lisbon here since Friday and been noticing how there are many, many more of these kind of mini market stores still at ground floor that we've really lost in the UK to these kind of big box supermarkets, your Tesco metros and these kind of things. And I'm really impressed that you can still read this kind of integration actually here across, um, across this city today. And this is another example I'm quite um, intrigued by, which is uh, an artist's quarters. So this is not, he, he wouldn't have been kind of selling his um, artworks directly from this house, probably. But you can read in the distinction between the upper floor and the lower floor where he'd worked and where he lived. So the upper floor would be his studios where he was painting, and this has much bigger windows, um, bigger floor to ceiling heights, uh, much more light needed for that kind of work. And down below was the residential space with uh, much more enclosure, more privacy to the street level, um, and therefore smaller, smaller windows. And so it wasn't until this moment, as I mentioned, of the Industrial Revolution when people um, centralized work in factories. And this really brought people into cities um, on one hand, so they'd been kind of living much more decentralized before. And uh, we really shifted into cities for the purpose of work. Um, into mills, into factories, uh, and we didn't really have the concept of cities as uh, sort of mass populations um, that we do today. And now, you know, it's so commonplace to hear this um, this statistic that we're now over 50% urbanized, and in the next 20 years, it's going to go up to 70%. And this is really because of work, you know, originally because of factories and mills, but now because of offices. Um, and because of that kind of network effect that having industries based in one place uh, kind of brings. I'm thinking of Silicon Valley, Silicon Roundabout in London, um, the kind of clustering effect of, of companies wanting to be together. And we also um, regulated for this in urban planning. So this is, a, this is a map of the city of London in the 1930s. Um, and you can see yellow is residential, and uh, brown, I think, is commercial, and red is, um, is uh, sales. And you can see there's almost no yellow at all. So residential was really non-existent um, in, in the city at that time. And that could be seen as a kind of uh, outcome of the City of London being a trading hub, being a business centre. But at the same time, it was an ideology. And after the Second World War, we kind of reinforced this ideology. So this is the, the rezoning plan after uh, much of the city was bombed, which also totally um, eradicates uh, even the, the potential for residential land uses within the city. And this kind of division actually created the suburb. Then we shifted towards this kind of idealized utopia perspective on where we did want to live. The suburb is a green place, um, a place of family, a place of community, and definitely not a place of work. So we really separated these two in, in, uh, in city planning and developed narratives around the garden city, around what it means to be at home, what type of activities we do there that are very distinctive from the type that we do at work. And so this created um, two quite distinct worlds, one of production, which is the factory or the office, and one of consumption, which is the home. And of course, this was triggered or kind of encouraged by the, introdu Ooh, the introduction of um, devices like um, televisions, radio, things that allowed us to consume culture within the home. And today we, we shift. We have the introduction of a new set of devices which allow us to work wherever we want, whenever we want. And in architecture and urban planning terms, this has really kind of blown open the opportunities for designing spaces. But also for planning, it's really quite a challenge. Um, you know, if there's no distinctive realm in which we work and no realm in which we live, how do we organize cities? Um, how do we organize transport? How do we define those two realms? Um, and at the same time, what this trend has done is turn us into both producers and consumers at any given moment. So whenever we're using our phone, we're consuming content, consuming information, but we're also producing data for someone else. 
Um, so we're kind of working, you could say. So always those two modes in any given space at the same time. This has led to the rise and rise and rise of co-working, which I'm sure you all know lots about and have probably been doing yourselves. Um, and I just want to bring one specific example of the co-working trend uh, and explore it a bit in relation to data, which is WeWork, uh, the, the biggest co-working provider in the world, which has gone through this insane trajectory in the past 10 years of valuation. Um, based on a very unusual model that they have no hard assets, they own no space, no physical buildings. They rent them, they kind of spice them up, and then they sublease them to either individual um, co-workers or increasingly to big multinationals. And lots of people are skeptical about this model um, and think it's a big bubble, it's ready to burst, it's nothing but Regus with a paint job. <laughs> um, but what's interesting about it is that, therefore, this, this valuation based on, um, based on speculation basically turns it into a kind of speculative design model. And as a futurist and architecture company, this is kind of the way we work. So I'm quite intrigued by this uh, multinational kind of global scale version. Um, because this is what we usually do in speculative design, these kind of weird prototypes. How do we extend our bodies? How do we augment ourselves? And yet we work as a business is kind of um, taking this into their psyche. And it's because they're promising this formula for the future of work. And they haven't figured it out yet, and they haven't sort of, they certainly haven't demonstrated it, and they haven't written it. Um, but this is the promise that's enabled them to accrue more and more venture capital over time. And if we think about what that promise is, it's based on an operating system like uh, Microsoft or Mac um, provide with Windows or OX, plus the kind of hardware, which would be the physical building or the office space, and then a series of plugins. So they've been busily um, purchasing a number of small startups which allow them to kind of program spaces. So it's not only about the configuration of the office, but also what do people do there, what kind of events, what kind of beer pong is happening on a Friday. All of these elements that almost augment people's experience of working in that area. Um, this might be a bit small to see, but what, what they're doing really is switching the model of office from renting based on square meterage to renting based on outcomes. So what this diagram shows at the top is um, a series of outcomes that are really quite ethereal things that have been quite difficult to measure up until now. But since we get more and more data, more and more sensors embedded in these spaces, we start to be able to measure things like health, productivity, happiness, collaboration. Um, and all of these aspects are kind of outcomes that we work uh, is encouraging and is promising to its renters. And this is done through a suite of data tracking and feedback loop strategies. So today it's the kind of humble sensor on the wall, but tomorrow it's really um, just every surface, every kind of uh, interaction monitored um, and recorded. And they have a system by which they do this. The first most spatial aspect is kind of laser scanning a, a space that they go into, feeding that into a building information model to be, to be processed and to be revised. Um, a WeWork app, which is going to kind of guide you around the building, guide you to events, um, let you know what's going on and powered by WE, which is their operating system, which is their kind of um, their key selling point, in a way. But if we think about what that operating system means on a, on a basic day-to-day -day level and what's the experience of someone in a WeWork uh, space, it's really, it really comes down to something as simple as beer. You, 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 know, you congregate on a, on a daily basis around something like having a drink, and these interactions that are created when people congregate is producing more data for WeWork. Um, so they say themselves will create purposeful points of density. And this is density of people, but it's also density of data. Uh, so they have this, um, this saying, come for a month, stay for life, which I already find creepy enough. But come for work, stay for beer is maybe the kind of reality day to day. Oh, I really like this guy's quote. He's from the London Spitalfields. Uh, <laughs> I didn't actually do any work, but the free pints were a great touch to the fancy wallpaper in impressive feng shui, <laughs> which I think kind of summarizes what they're doing. So my point is, in a way, because of this idea of the prosumer, that we've combined production with consumption, it doesn't really matter what you're doing in, in a WeWork space. You could be drinking beer, you could be having a conversation. It doesn't matter. 
but because you're paying for access, because you're paying a subscription fee, simply your relationship with the space and with the product is the product itself because it produces their formula for what the perfect working environment is. You're, produ you're producing their valuation, essentially. Um, and in a way, this has always been the case with architecture because any value uh, for a building for land is based on the potential for interaction or for inhabitation there. I mean, if you think of a, an area of housing that's inaccessible, there's no roads going there, or it has no schools, it has no facilities, no one wants to live there, then the value is very low. So by kind of creating this inhabitation, we, we, are, we are doing what architecture has always done, but WeWork makes it very explicit because it's kind of recording, and you can see the, the relationship between the inputs and the outputs there. They're now moving into other realms, so not only workspace, but um, housing with We Live, and also We Grow, which is a set of schools that are starting in New York, but potentially going to be kind of going as, as wide as WeWork is already. Um, and when we think about this in the home, you could say that we're already starting to introduce some of these data tracking devices into our homes. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has an Amazon Alexa, but you, you probably know that it's always listening to you, um, even when you're not telling it to do things. And so this kind of data capture model where you're, you don't think you're working or you don't know you're working, but you are in fact working for someone else, you're producing value for someone else uh, far away. So in a way, the home has gone 360. This is my theory, that we've kind of brought work back into the home, um, unlo unknowingly so, and for the purpose maybe of convenience, but that this uh, return to a kind of pre-industrial model is actually what we're witnessing here, um, and we're unconsciously working at home again. So this is my final slide now, where it should be. <laughs> the idea that have we gone back to the future, and now we're living, consuming, producing, selling, all from our living rooms. Um, I'd love to discuss that with everyone, actually. <laughs> yeah.